In the six years that Dan Harmon's sitcom Community aired from 2009 to 2014, it managed to be cancelled twice, have its showrunner very publicly fired, have its showrunner very publicly rehired, lose four main cast members, and was deemed responsible for the collapse of an entire streaming platform. So, uh, quite the legacy. There are some shows that ran for twice as long without ever even getting cancelled once. And yet, while other shows of the era, like Parks and Recreation, 30 Rock, and The Office, enjoyed longer and less tumultuous runs, Community managed to do something that none of these other sitcoms could, and that's because the subject matter of Community wasn't just wacky shenanigans and silly storylines. Rather, Community tasked itself with answering one of the most complex and important questions of human existence, namely, how do we communicate with one another? In other words, how do we practice rhetoric? In every way possible, community is obsessed with rhetoric, from the ways that we can manipulate it, to the ways that it can manipulate us. In the world of community, rhetoric is not only a powerful tool that we can harness to our benefit, it is the central organizing force that binds all of us together. It can help us to understand the world, to come together, to break apart, and to ultimately... Uh, but... We'll come to that. But for now, let's start at the top. Part 1. What is community? What community was when it began and what it was by the time it ended are two very different things. In the first season, you could describe community as being about a group of seven people from different backgrounds and with diverse worldviews who form a study group together while attending a small community college in Colorado. It's got a Cheers-esque vibe to it, an ensemble of unlikely allies thrown together by proximity. But by the end? I mean, somewhere around their third animated episode, this show is no longer the humble little ensemble comedy it was when it started. And this gradual transformation from normal American network sitcom to, well, this... Hey! My name's Tommy Toluca. I'm from Hallway C. I'm a two. I gotta get to the cafeteria before they run out of apples! <laughs> is worth examining because it's at the core of what community accomplishes over its six season run, as it turns itself from typical NBC show to something more meaningful. And I want to stress the normalcy of community's early days because I think a lot of fans forget about that. Looking back, you can easily imagine it airing alongside contemporary NBC shows like Animal Practice, 1600 Pen, and Outsourced, which are about a wacky animal hospital, a wacky White House, and a wacky call center in India, respectively. Community, as it was introduced to audiences, is a decidedly normal show that you can almost imagine 7 million people tuning in to see. The main character of Jeff, a former lawyer who is trying to complete his undergraduate degree, is a mostly normal everyman who's our point of view character to the wacky shenanigans that are going on at Greendale. Uh, shenanigans like the dean holding a student disciplinary hearing next to a pool. <laughs> Just a uh, wacky dean. Uh, goodness me, what a character. And there's this Spanish teacher who, and you're going to get a laugh out of this, has an anger management problem. Yeah, we're a long way from the disgraced ex-Spanish teacher living in the school's ventilation system and the dean... Well, I mean, insert your own description of the dean's evolution here. But as the first season progresses, something fundamental begins to change, and we see it happen in the show's most seminal and important season one episode... No, no, not the paintball one. In the show's first season episode, Comparative Religion, the group comes together to celebrate Christmas, but discovers that their various religious views put them at odds with one another. As a result, they end up belittling, rejecting, criticizing, and demeaning one another's most closely held beliefs. Beliefs that contribute to their fundamental worldviews. And yet, in the end, the group resolves their differences, bands together, and has a holiday celebration that is enjoyed by everyone. And, sure, this doesn't seem terribly novel in the grand six-season scheme of community. The gang threatened to part ways roughly every third episode, and the characters frequently found themselves forced to set aside their different ideological identities and beliefs in service of a greater collective good. And yet this episode marks a change, because what happens in the very next episode? Part 2. A Change Has Occurred 
Buddy arrives. Yes, as the group reconvenes for the start of their second semester together, Buddy joins the group. Played by Jack Black, Buddy unexpectedly invites himself into the study group, occupying the normally vacant eighth seat at the study table. And as the members of the group roundly reject him, we as an audience are meant to reject him too. Buddy is loud, he's obnoxious, he plays the guitar and sings a lot, and, well, let's be honest with ourselves, he isn't even close to the worst member that the study group would have over the years. But Buddy's natural rhythms don't gel with the rest of the group. He's not communicating on the same wavelength, and consider the implication of that for a moment. This group of weird and diverse people with their different backgrounds, perspectives, and beliefs now have a shared... something. Something that's unique to them, something that excludes any random person off the street from joining even though the group is literally made up of a bunch of random people off the street. So what is it that this group now shares, and is that element the same thing that made them a, dare I say it, community? Well, that element is a collective decision about the shared use of rhetoric. Part 3. Zip Zop Zooey and now we get to talk about the rhetorical concept of semiotics. Yeah, it's what you guys were all waiting for, right? Okay, there's a reason I buried this nearly a thousand words into the video. Semiotics and the larger study of rhetoric aren't known for being a ton of fun. Uh, but the concept of semiotics ends up being kind of important to how we understand... Uh, how the entire world works? Too big a promise? Okay, hear me out. Simply put, semiotics is a tool that consists of two parts, a sign and a meaning. So this is a sign, and it means... Well, what does it mean? Well, it means stop, but how does it convey that meaning to us, and why do you know what it means? Well, it's because we as a community have agreed on what it means. Uh, there is no intrinsic meaning to a red octagon. It could mean hello, or hungry, or happy. It could mean ice cream, or beware sharks. It has the potential to mean just about anything, because signs like this don't have any set meaning. We collectively decide on their meaning. Uh, this meaning can be defined formally. This bunch of squiggles here would have meant nothing to most people a few decades ago, but then it was officially decided that it is the symbol for a USB port. Uh, the meaning of science can change over time. This used to mean number, but now it's a hashtag. And meanings can be personal. If you see someone wearing a t-shirt with Pokemon on it, do you interpret that sign as meaning, wow, that is one cool dude? Or do you think, hmm, that person's a bit of a nerd? Uh, for reference, my interpretation of such a shirt would depend entirely on which Pokemon it depicts, as I refuse to acknowledge the existence of any Pokemon created after 1996 and insist on referring to all such Pokemon as counterfeit Bakugan. But back to my point. The relationship between signs and meaning is constructed. In the world of community, the study group has come together to form a system of signs and meanings that are exclusive to their group. This began all the way back in the first episode when Abed tells Jeff, I see your value. I'm sorry I called you Michael Douglas, and I see your value now. This acts as a callback to an earlier exchange that the two of them shared at the beginning of the episode, and this means that the two of them understand the significance of that phrase in a way that is unique to them. The two have constructed a special meaning for this sign. Well, that's the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. And as the series progresses, and the group develops its own terms, jokes, references, and worldview, it has the effect of excluding those who aren't a part of that group. We see this very vividly illustrated at the end of the Buddy episode, as Abed and Troy perform their disco spider rap to an unimpressed Starburns, who interrupts and dismisses them. Let me hear that rap thing of yours again. Me llamo T-Bone, la araña, discoteca, discoteca, muneca, la biblioteca. All right, I'm going to talk it over with the others. Cool, thanks for your time. What has significance to Troy, to Abed, and to the audience is treated without reverence by somebody who is outside that community and doesn't have the complex meaning that matches the sign. 
And yes, while we as audience members aren't members of the study group, we are indeed members of this community. We speak the same language, we know the same pairings of signs and meanings as these characters. We know what it means to be streets ahead, to use Britta as a verb, to employ Schmitty as an insult of the highest order. Bear down for midterms, the Lindbergh lead, de doy, pop pop, yuba duba duba, zip zop zooey. These phrases are complete nonsense, unless we as a community agree on how to make sense of them. And to some extent, this helps explain why communities struggle to attract new viewers. If you're somebody who watched Community from the beginning, who followed these characters as they grew and changed, who developed an affinity for and knowledge of this world, each episode added to your lexicon of phrases, your collection of signs and their corresponding meanings, and made you more of a member. But if you stumbled by chance upon a random episode, what were you to make of it? A Ken Burns-style faux documentary about a pillow fort at war with a blanket fort? An episode where the school's security guard uses a militarized group of children to seize control of a community college? Alternate universe doppelgangers using dimension-hopping paintballs to murder their prime universe counterparts? This show almost seemed to pride itself on being unintelligible to the uninitiated. And I want to make it clear that what was happening on Community was distinct from what tends to happen with many long-running shows. In a lot of TV series, there are storylines and character arcs that span multiple episodes. One that comes to mind is How I Met Your Mother. This was another sitcom about a small group of close friends that prized long-running jokes and storylines. The slap bet, the blue French horn, the yellow umbrella, the ducky tie, the bro code, and heck, they even had their own set of doppelgangers. And like Community, they used their audience's familiarity with these signs and symbols to play with the half-hour sitcom format. They did flashbacks, they did flash-forwards, they did anthology episodes... And so, what made Community's use of similar elements so different to How I Met Your Mother's? Part 4. The In-Group and the Out-Group How I Met Your Mother developed, over the course of nine years, an insanely complicated series of signs and meanings that spawned a loyal audience that grew and grew over the course of its run until its final episode garnered the show's highest ratings ever. And yet, as someone who enjoyed How I Met Your Mother while it was on the air, did I ever feel like a part of this five-person gang of friends? Uh, did I feel a familiarity for McLaren's bar? Did I identify with these characters? Did I take on the words and phrases these characters used and incorporate them into my own life? I can honestly say no. And I feel like this happened for the same reason that How I Met Your Mother was able to get so weird and yet remain so consistently accessible to viewers. And that's the narrator. Throughout every single episode, without exception, we would be guided through the story by the main character's older self. He would remind us what the pineapple incident was. He would orient us in time. He would never let us forget where we were in the nine-year-long saga of these characters meeting the titular mother. As an experiment, just pick a random episode of How I Met Your Mother and watch it. It doesn't matter if it's one that incorporates three different timelines, or is part of a multi-episode arc, or if it has a musical number or a genre homage. You will get through it with a pretty solid understanding of what's going on. Now pretend like you've never seen an episode of Community before, and watch the Ass Crack Bandit episode. You know, the episode that begins with a novelty title sequence paying homage to the 1995 David Fincher film Seven, and ends with Pierce, a main character, dying off-screen while Ben Folds sings a song that includes the lyric, Out of the shadow, down the coin goes, why oh why do you suppose, only the bandit knows. Actually, I tell a lie, this episode doesn't begin with its opening credits. It starts with Shirley's two sons singing the Radiohead song Creep in a style reminiscent of a trailer for a different David Fincher film, The Social Network. Yeah, I mean, look, it isn't like the references in Community were more obscure than those in other shows. How I Met Your Mother had a long-running storyline that satirized low-budget, mid-80s Canadian educational shows. But Community, well, it created an in-group and an out-group. There were those who understood the show and those who didn't. 
And the way that you got the show was you let the show change you. Your internal rhetorical system of signs and meanings was manipulated as you watched it. And that's where those homage-style episodes come in. I'm actually not sure if there's a generally accepted term for the episodes of Community that take on the cliches and tropes of a specific genre or style of film. I've seen them called parodies, but they're really not. I'm going to use the term homage and hope we're all on the same page. The first homage episode occurs very late in the first season. In contemporary American poultry, the group makes the choice to view the world around them through the rhetorical lens of mafia films. I'll say what I think is happening here again. The group, including us as viewers, are looking at the external world, a world of signs that are open to interpretation, and we are using an external reference source to agree on a new, unique way of interpreting what is occurring in the world. The stylistic conventions that are employed by this episode construct a rhetorical frame around the actions of these characters and give them a new meaning that is uniquely understood by the members of our community. This system, whereby we co-opt semiotic relationships from external media sources to create a collective understanding, allows for us to have a system in which we all derive meaning from the world around us in the same way as one another. This is huge. I remember that just half a season ago, the group was about to split up due to their inability to communicate, and yet here we are. Making references to Goodfellas doesn't just help the show make a few gags or tell a silly story, it's cementing the idea that there are those who are in the group and understand what's going on, and there are those who, for lack of a better term, are streets behind. The episode concludes by, well, basically stating this outright. As the Mafia movie homage ends, Abed tells Jeff that having everyone share this framework for understanding the world has allowed him to connect with other people in a way that he had otherwise struggled to do. And as a viewer, someone who loved this show since it first aired, I do feel connected to it. Its story, its characters, and the world that it exists in. And even back then, as season one ended and as season two began, and as the show's ratings continued to struggle, the show did something that was, well, kind of radical. I mean, yeah, season two started more or less the way you'd expect. Uh, the group threatens to split up, but then rediscovers the importance of staying a group. Interspersed with stories like these are opportunities for the characters to adopt a shared worldview that filters the world through a specific lens. We get Dungeons and Dragons, Claymation, an Apollo 13 homage, a zombie movie, a conspiracy thriller. But then we get to the 21st episode of Season 2, Paradigms of Human Memory. Part 5, The Dangers and Limitations of Rhetoric. In this episode, we see flashbacks to episodes that never happened. And for the first time, we as audience members are excluded from the community that the show has created. Here we discover that the group has gone on all kinds of adventures without us. They've been to a haunted house, grappled with drug lords, visited an old west town, developed an appreciation for the cape that's only gotten more and more hilarious in the decades since the cape has become something that only exists in pop culture as a throwaway reference in this episode. And we as audience members are no longer on the same page as the group. They have become so insular that they've actually blocked us from being a part of their community. And you wonder why this show struggled to find an audience. There's Bob Saget on How I Met Your Mother explaining how he came to own a pair of red cowboy boots and Community has decided that we don't get to know why the entire group was admitted to a psychiatric facility. And as the show continues into Season 3, the group becomes openly hostile to including new members. A contrast the begrudgingly rude treatment Buddy received with the psychopathic exclusion of Todd, which ends with this army veteran and father of two in tears while the group laughs. And the members of this group are indeed revealed to have extreme personality disorders, as seen in the season's fifth episode, Horror Fiction in Seven Easy Steps. There is, indeed, something wrong with them. In the fourth season episode, Alternative History of the German Invasion, we learn that the entirety of Greendale views our study group as insular, cliquish, and mean. These seven people who have experienced personal growth and happiness by founding a community with one another 
are discovering that this same community has also made them toxic. By developing their own system of signs and meanings, by creating this way of understanding the world that only has meaning to them, they've set themselves apart from others. And then, in Season 5, the community is broken. Pierce dies. Troy leaves. And for the first time ever, the group accepts a new permanent member in Buzz Hickey. I don't think it's a coincidence that this is also the season where the group's tendency to filter the world through a fictional lens is portrayed as being more overtly dangerous than it has been in previous seasons. A school-wide game of The Floor's Lava is actually a not terribly healthy coping mechanism that Abed uses to process his grief, and while Abed has used similar mechanisms in the past, they've typically ended on a positive note of growth. Here, the use of a shared rhetorical lens only results in Abed pretending that he's been replaced with a near-identical clone as a coping mechanism. A school-wide sci-fi dystopia leaves Greendale in complete chaos and causes the Dean to encourage everyone to just move on and forget that any of this happened. An animated G.I. Joe homage is actually the result of a comatose Jeff struggling for life after taking dangerous drugs. This rhetorical tool for creating a communal understanding and worldview has its limits, and the world of Greendale encounters them here. But having said that, in this season, we also see the tool of viewing the world through a communal rhetorical lens used in its most deliberate manner by the group yet. In the show's second Dungeons & Dragons episode, the group recognize the power of sharing a storytelling-induced framework and employ it in a specific, almost surgical manner to reunite Buzz Hickey and his estranged son. And it works. Very well. But not for the core members of the group not for the five that have been with us in Season 1. These two new characters find value in it, but there isn't much there for the characters that we've been following for five seasons. And in the sixth season of Community, we see a certain disinterest in these homage-style episodes. Uh, could you even count Grifting 101 as an homage, as the study group members aren't even familiar with the tropes of the genre and have to sit down midway through the episode and watch the movie they're trying to reference? And the year's paintball episode, Modern Espionage, mostly just feigns towards homage-style elements with a novel opening theme and action movie-style sequences, but the point of the episode ends up being that these shared homages are kind of stupid, immature, and unnecessary. Because at the end of six seasons, an external mechanism for understanding the world through a shared collective media lens isn't necessary. Community has kind of outgrown itself. The final episode of the show is spent with the group sitting at a bar, pitching ideas for a potential season 7, and deciding that there are no visions for their future that they can all agree on. More than that, the episode ends with the group deciding not to even try, as each member closes their eyes and selects their own future, apart from the others. And so what is the lesson of community? And what as audience members are we meant to take away from it? Part 6. Conclusion? In some ways, we've ended up right where we started. There is no more gang. These are just a bunch of random individuals who are going about their lives without a study group, without a Save Greendale committee, without a community. Has the entire show been about the futility of communities? About the impermanence of human connection? Is the real story of community that we're all destined to be alone in the end, and that the bonds we make with one another will inevitably break? I mean, this is Dan Harmon's other show, so I wouldn't put it past him to end this one on such a nihilistic moral, but I don't think that's the takeaway that most of Community's fans got. And I don't think that's what community as a whole ends up teaching us. There's an episode, early in season one, where Abed creates a movie that allows him to communicate his thoughts and feelings to his distant father. This illustrates community's opening argument, that media is a helpful tool that allows us to understand one another better. Because we live here in the 21st century, we are constantly surrounded by the semiotics of media, the signs and symbols of genres, 
and we can use them to form collective meanings with one another, to understand one another through them, using them as tools. But when we do this, there is a danger. We can become so ensconced in our groups, in our ways of communicating, that we end up doing harm both to others and to ourselves. We can become exclusionary, elitist, and we can end up alienating others rather than doing what we wanted to, connecting with one another. And once we've reached the end of our capacity to use these tools productively, we can set them aside, almost like scaffolding. They were a framework that allowed a community to form, but they weren't what was keeping the community standing. And when people come into our lives, or when they go away, that's okay, because even the community itself is just a tool. A tool to help us become better, healthier, happier. If a community film ever happens, I would be interested in seeing what a fully actualized Jeff Winger looks like, or how Abed without Troy navigates the larger world around him. I think this is the last answer that community really has to give. What does it mean to exist post-community? So, when we build communities with one another, I think that we can take some lessons from community about how to do it right, the dangers of doing it wrong, and when developing a uniquely shared understanding of the world ends up being more trouble than it's worth. And with these lessons, maybe we can all have a healthier discourse and a more productive relationship with the people we create communities with. And in the end, hopefully the process will leave us all in a better place. And I hope I've left you in a better place. I want to thank you for watching, and if you've enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate it if you check out some of the other ones on this channel and maybe consider subscribing. Hope to see you soon. Bye.